Hey there, drone fans. Rick here again from Drone Valley. Today's clip is for flyers that are new to the hobby and includes a bunch of tips and tricks that I've learned over the years to help make your journey up into the skies a little bit safer and a whole lot more fun. Now, before I get started, I don't care what kind of quads you fly. Everybody out there has got a favorite quad. All I care about is you've got something you like and you're getting up in the air with that quad. So what I'm gonna talk about today applies to every quad on the market. And honestly, I've been flying quads for a long time and I fly everything that's out there, starting with these smaller quads like this Esheen product that's less than $50. I fly that all over the house. I just love that thing in the winter time all the way up to the larger quads like the Inspire 2, which quite honestly is like a pterodactyl up in the skies and a little bit scary. But the experience is the same for me and I know it will be for you as well because that magical moment of having a product like this lift off the ground and give you a perspective from above is just unmatched in any other hobby out there. So I completely understand why you're enjoying this hobby and I wanna welcome you into the family. And having said that, this is a very embracing community. You're gonna find that there are a ton of YouTube channels out there and other resources you can find that'll explain quads to you, talk about the technology behind it. We do a lot of that on this channel as well, but spend the time to view those channels and learn about the hobby because it's an amazingly cool thing that you're doing. And you'll find that the hobby is very embracing, that the people out there talking about quads that fly these things are not gonna be sort of put offish. They're gonna be people that are embracing and bring you into the fold and they'll answer your question. So if you come up with a question about anything I've talked about in any of these sections that are coming up, drop them in the comments below. I'll do my best to answer it for you as quickly as I can. Now to make this clip a little bit more sane, I'm gonna break this into different sections because each of these sections require a little bit of time and I wanted to break it down into sort of bite-sized pieces so you could watch a section, maybe take a brag and come back and watch another section. I didn't wanna run through this clip too quickly because a lot of the stuff I'm talking about is super important and when I think back to when I put my first quad up with my son I had a million questions so I want to try and answer 999,000 of those for you today in this clip so it tends to be a little bit longer a clip but I'll put a time code below where you can sort of skip ahead if there's a section you care more about than others but I'm going to do my best to answer those questions today for you and again I really appreciate you watching the channel so stay tuned and we'll get started. I called this first section Know Your Gear because I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about the technology behind these incredible products. Now even though quads are a lot of fun to fly and pretty easy to get up off the ground and in the air, there's still a tremendous amount of engineering packed under the hood of these guys to allow you to lift off the ground and hold a stable position, let alone control it to go forward, back, left and right or rise up and then find its way back home. Now even a simple quad like this has an amazing amount of technology inside this little cabinet. Now I'm gonna do a blow up of that, but that's a double-sided printed circuit board with specialized chips on there to keep track of things like speed and accelerometers and, and height and all the rest of the compass. There's a lot of things built into it. And when you get into a more sophisticated quad like this, you now introduce things like GPS coordination, stabilized gimbal movements, you're doing video streaming, high definition video streaming back to a controller. You've got return to home functionality in there with artificial intelligence deciding to crash into a tree or not crash into a tree, return to home when the battery's getting low, the controller's a lot more sophisticated, so it can get complicated pretty quickly. And I'll be honest with you, the difference between the average person lifting this off the ground and flying it, and lifting it off the ground and flying it off the property into a tree is really just a matter of you understanding what the technology can do. And the first place to do that, and really the best place to do that, is in the manual. So the first thing I recommend to anybody buying a new quad, before you charge the batteries, before you go outside to fly this thing, read the manual. And I know that's a boring exercise and I hate doing it as well, but even something as small as this where I've got a $50 investment, I wanna make sure that I take care of it and I understand what its capabilities are and how to fly the thing correctly because beyond just losing my investment, or worse, losing my investment here, I've got a responsibility to people around me to not come clobbering somebody with my quad because I'm flying it in a park in an afternoon. So read the manual, that's all I'll say because inside there are all those nuggets of details you'll need to understand exactly what this guy can do, what adjustments you can make to it, and how you can fly it and get the best possible experience out of that product. So read the manual, that's the first thing I'll suggest. The next two things have to do with putting together lists. Now, I'm a big list guy. I've got a list before I leave the house, and I've got a list called a pre-flight checklist. So the, the list I put together before I leave the house includes everything I need for an afternoon of flying, depending on which quad I'm taking. So inside my case for the quad, I've got the list. And that list has things like, do you have the batteries? Do you have the cables? Do you have um, you know the landing gear? Do you have a landing mat? All the stuff I'm gonna need because there's nothing worse than putting your kit in the car, driving 45 minutes to a location, popping it out, getting ready to fly, and finding out you're missing a cable. That's a horrible experience because you gotta drive back to the house to get that gear. So that before I leave the house list is really important to make sure that I've got everything I need in the box so when I go there I can just fly and have a good afternoon. 
The pre-flight checklist is a little more complicated, and that has to do with checking the quad before I put it up in the air, because you only get one chance to make a mistake with a quad up in the air, and I'll say that again. There are a lot of single points of failure on a quad that if you're not careful, you can have issues. And those big ones are the props and the battery. So making sure the battery's fully charged and fully seated on the product, make sure that the, the props are in good shape, that they're not nicked up and dinged, there's no debris on them, they're fully seated on here and they're attached properly, are just a couple of things I check before every flight because I wanna not only take off and enjoy the day, but I want that quad to come back home with me at the end of the day so I can enjoy those pictures and go out the next day and fly it again. So a pre-flight checklist, and there's a ton of them on the net, and I'll put a link below where you can see the one I use, is really just a great way to make sure that, again, as a pilot, and I know it sounds corny to say you're a pilot, but technically if you're putting a quad up in the air or you're the pilot in charge, you have a responsibility to make sure your equipment is ready to fly and it's safe. So that pre-flight checklist is important. Last thing I'll say about your gear, and I know there's a lot of controversy out there about this, but I'm going to recommend you, you register your quad. It's actually a law with the FAA that anything over a certain weight, over 0.55 pounds, has to be registered. It's a $5 registration fee, and you're taking care of it just by going to the website, and I'll put a link below for that as well, and registering your quad. Um, I, I can't stress how important that is, and a lot of people will look at it and go, oh, that's just a government intervention. The FAA looks at how many registered pilots they've got, and we as a group are really pretty powerful. I mean, they look at that and they think, uh, you know, there's a lot of people out there flying. They ask for opinions all the time. We have a really loud voice on what regulations and legislation comes down in the future. So having more people registered gives them the impression that there are an awful lot of flyers out there that every time they make a decision, it can impact a large body of, of voting public, quite honestly. So it's important to register your quad. And also it's the law. So definitely do that. And that's pretty much it for this section. So stay tuned and we'll get into the next section now. This section is called Know the Rules because I think it's really important that any flyer that's going to put a quad up in the air understands what the regulations are that are in place today so you don't get yourself into trouble. And it's no different than when you were a kid and you got a new game for Christmas. The first thing you did was tear off the box, flip it over, and read the rules so you understood how to play the game. It's exactly the same thing here. Now, before I get into them, and there aren't a lot of them, but there's a lot of confusion around them, I thought I would define the two class of flyers that are out there today. So, technically, there are two class of flyers out there flying quads today. There's the hobbyist class, which is probably most of you, if you've got a new quad and you're just flying it for fun, that's where you are. But if you wanna fly that quad for commercial purposes, you've gotta be a commercial flyer. And to do that, you've gotta pass a part 107 exam, which is a kind of a junior pilot's exam that involves a lot of questions around the regulatory controls around airports and cloud formations and weather and things like that. But it's not that hard a test to pass. And if you wanna fly commercially, that's where you're gonna be. Now, the main difference between those two classes is that the commercial class can fly and charge money for their work. So if you're gonna do roof inspections, or you're gonna take pictures for real estate agents, you've gotta be a commercial flyer. If you're a hobbyist, you can't do that. Other than that, most of the rules apply to both classes. So let me get into the rules now. There are really five golden rules that you have to follow. There's a bunch of nuance to them, but these are the ones that'll keep you out of most of the trouble. The first one has to do with how high you can fly. There's a limit on any quad you've got, 400 foot is the ceiling. You can't really fly a quad above 400 feet, except if you're close enough to a building, then you can fly 400 feet above that building. But anywhere else, you've got to stay 400 feet above ground level is your maximum. Um, so be very careful about that. Now, that number wasn't pulled out of thin air. The reason that number is there is because commercial pilots have to stay above 500 feet unless they're approaching a runway or they're in an emergency situation. So that gives us, as quad flyers, a buffer of 100 feet, so we're not going to inadvertently introduce our quad into a commercial airliner. So stay under 400 feet and you'll be fine. A lot of the newer quads, like the DJI products, actually have geofencing built in that won't let you fly above 400 feet. And I like that because I know what that limit is and it keeps me under that limit. So that's the first one. The second has to do with how far you can fly. Now, a lot of these smaller quads that rely on Wi-Fi really are limited to 100 yards at most because the Wi-Fi signal won't carry further than that. So it's not going to be an issue for you. But if you go to a more sophisticated quad like this that uses OcuSync or some other exotic technology, you could probably fly this thing five miles. But the limit is you can't fly beyond visual line of sight, which means means even squinting, as far as that quad can fly, as long as you can still see it, it's okay. Now, probably the younger you are, the farther you can fly, you get to be an old guy like me. I'm limited to, I don't know, a half a mile if I'm lucky on a clear day to see that quad, but you can't fly beyond visual line of sight. And the reason for that is because when you're flying your quad, even if you've got sophisticated cameras in the front of it, you can't really see peripherally what's around you. So there could be a plane coming in for a landing or a helicopter up there, and they just want to avoid those collisions. Now, I will tell you, part of the reauthorization bill that just passed would be enabling visual line of sight uh, limitations being lifted. So they're talking about this concept of beyond visual line of sight, which may involve certain types of quads, but we'll see how that plays out. But today, you can't fly further than you can see the quad. 
The other place you can't fly is in with, within five miles of an airport. And now um, most of the quads like these that have NFZ zones built in will show you exactly where that envelope is and probably won't let you take off if you're within the five miles. But just be aware of that because if you're flying something smaller that isn't as sophisticated, there aren't any fences up there that tell you you can't fly into that area. So you've got to really be aware of where you're flying to make sure you don't cross into that five mile barrier. So that's another super important one. Um, another rule is you can't fly over groups of people. So if there's a large group of people, you can't fly directly over them. You've got to fly around them and give them plenty of space so that you're not putting that quad over top of them. And again, the reason for that rule is that God forbid something happens with that quad and it comes out of the sky, you don't want to clonk somebody on the head. So great rule to follow. And then the last one I'll talk about, and this is the one where it gets a little confusing, is you're not allowed to fly at night, period. That's it. You can fly within what we call civil daylight hours. So you can fly close to night and you can fly in the morning when it's dark getting lighter, but there are rules and you can read them on the website of exactly when you can fly. But if it's dark out, you can't put your quad up. So all you guys out there thinking, I'll just put my quad up and capture some beautiful fireworks display. You can't do that without a waiver. So don't do that. If you follow these five rules, you'll be in pretty good shape. And honestly, they're common sense rules anyway, because you've got a responsibility as a pilot. The minute you put this thing up in the air, to protect people around you. Otherwise, you're gonna get in a whole lot of trouble. So putting the quad up, following these rules will keep you safe, and it'll make sure that you can enjoy your quad and not have to worry about somebody tapping you on the shoulder going, you violated a rule, come talk to me, land that quad. So that's pretty much it for this section. Follow those rules and you'll be in good shape. Well, that's it for this first installment in the new Flyer series, and I hope you found that content helpful. As I mentioned in the beginning of the clip, I have a lot more content I'll be covering in future installments to try and answer all the questions you probably have as a new flyer. Because I think back to when I first started flying a bunch of years ago, I had a ton of questions and it was really difficult to find the right answer quickly to know that I was doing the right thing when I was flying. So my intent behind this series is to try and answer all the questions you have that I had when I first started flying so you can get up in the air quicker and safer and be a better pilot. And again, you being a better pilot is good for the rest of us because we all fly a little bit safer. So if you haven't subscribed to the channel, I've got a lot more content coming in this series. You're definitely going to hit that subscribe button down there and turn on the notification. And that way, when I post a new installment, you'll know that it's up. If you have questions and anything I've covered in these first two segments, please drop them in the comments below. Or if you have questions I didn't get a chance to cover yet that you need answered, drop those down there as well, and I'll work them into a future installment. I love putting these clips together. So if you guys are enjoying this content, I'll keep doing it. I've got links below for all the things I've mentioned for the FAA registration and a few other things. So make sure you check down there in the comments for those as well. I really appreciate you guys watching. And until next time, happy flying.